All right, so our fourth and final inference rule for the quantifiers is existential elimination. So suppose our universe is our classroom, the students in our classroom, and we say truly that someone is funny. There exists an x, f of x. Now, pretty clearly, it would be wrong to infer from this that any particular individual, such as Alexis, is funny. So, something like this, there exists an x, f of x, therefore f of a, is clearly not right. It's not valid and not something we'd want a rule to permit. But there are valid inferences that require us to remove the existential quantifier. So think of this one. Anyone that is funny is goofy. Someone is funny, therefore someone is goofy. Now, if we're going to prove this, which we represent symbolically below, we are somehow going to have to strip this existential quantifier off. Essentially, we're going to need to create. We know how to do the universal. We can have if f a, then g a, right? But we're going to need to be able to write f of a in order to get g of a, which will ultimately give us there exists an x g of x by existential introduction. So the question is, how are we going to do that? What sort of rule will permit us to remove the existential quantifier, but only allow us to make valid inferences once we have done so? Well, the answer is a, a, a hypothetical rule. That is, we're going to create a rule that only allows us to remove the quantifier and insert a name hypothetically. And when we're done, we, in a sense, have to put it back. So. It turns out that existential elimination, along with conditional introduction and negation introduction, right, are all hypothetical rules. And that's all there are. There are no more. So we have three hypothetical rules. So let's learn this one. Now the idea is actually pretty simple. It's a little more complicated than, than universal elimination, but not much. Excuse me, universal introduction, but not much. So let's go back to the classroom. We know someone is funny, but we don't know who. But we want to do some inferences about whoever that person is that's funny. So what we do is we just assign that person, whoever it is, some hypothetical name, something, some name that in a sense we just make up, say, Dwid. So the trick is to make sure that nobody in the room is already named Dwid, right? So you can just say, let's just call this person Dwid. And then you can do inferences about Dwid. And because Dwid isn't anybody in particular, you're not going to make the mistake of making inferences that are based on specific information about a specific person. Dwid will be what the book calls a representative individual. So more formally with existential elimination, our hypothesis is going to be a predicate logic woof containing some name that is not in an assumption or in an undischarged hypothesis or in the existential hypothesis itself. Now, we're already used to the first two restrictions because those restrictions we encountered with universal introduction, right? And this restriction comes as a result of the fact that the existential elimination is a uh, hypothetical rule. 
So what these restrictions do is they essentially preserve the anonymity of DWID, right? They make us pick a name that isn't already in our proof. So effectively, our proof is our little universe, right? If the name doesn't occur in an assumption or in an undischarged hypothesis or in the existential hypothesis itself, then we haven't, we've safeguarded ourselves from making inferences that uh, use information that are specifically about some particular individual. So just like with our other hypothetical rules, we have to discharge the hypothesis. And in doing so, we discharge the, the, the name we used with it. So to do this properly, we need to make sure that the last line of the hypothetical derivation does not contain this name. So that's pretty abstract for now, but let's see how this works uh, with the argument we just uh, previously recognized as valid. So for all x, if f of x, then g of x, and there exists an x f of x, let's show using existential elimination that there must it must be the case that there exists an x g of x. So we take these two on as assumptions, and then our first move is to hypothesize for existential elimination, and just as in the other ones, there's no requirement to write this, it's just for our own benefit. We hypothesize for existential elimination f of a. Now, if I'm gonna use f of a, I want to make sure that A is not contained in any assumption or in any previous hypothesis. Well, there is no previous hypothesis, and A does not occur in any of these assumptions, so we're okay. And now we can proceed in a rather familiar way. Uh, we can write if F of A, then G of A by one and universally elimination, and then we can have G of A by three, four, conditional elimination, and then we can use existential introduction to get our conclusion. So it feels sort of like at this point that we're done, we do have our conclusion, but we have not justified, uh, excuse me, we have not discharged um, our hypothesis. So then the question is, how do we do that? And the answer is very simply that we rewrite this last line again. We rewrite the conclusion, taking away the indent and dropping a line, right? So, write, there ex we have exists an x, g of x here, write it here, drop a line as we just did, and then we write in our justification over here. The justification is existential elimination and you'll notice there are three numbers here, two comma three dash six. So what does that mean? Well, the three dash six is what you're already familiar with. It's running from the hypothesis to the uh, very end of the hypothetical derivation. So three through six, what does two indicate? Well, two indicates the original existential hypothesis that we were um, instantiating, okay? So it was on the basis of this existential here that we made f of a, and that's what two is indicating. So two, three, through six. Now, one thing that's a little sort of interesting in this, what I'm explaining in this yellow box over here, to bear in mind is that if you make a mistake, and it's very easy to make a mistake doing existential elimination proofs, generally speaking, if you make a mistake regarding the existential elimination process itself, rather than just uh, some inference rule or other that you get wrong, um, what, what the mis where the mistake typically occurs is here. It doesn't occur here. In other words, there, you'll remember that we've always said you can hypothesize anything you want for any reason you want. So you can't really ever make a mistake simply by uh, creating a hypothesis of some kind. 
But when we get to this final step, then that's when this hypothesis can start to look like a kind of mental error. And so we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some erroneous, uh, erroneous uses of existential elimination to give you a feel for the kinds of mistakes that you're going to need to avoid. So here's an example of an improperly done existential elimination proof. And in fact, the ones that we're going to be considering right now, they're going to be improperly done, partly because there, there is no proper way to do these. These are actually valid infer invalid inferences. It doesn't follow, for example, that if there exists something that's funny and there exists something that's goofy, that there exists some one thing that's funny and goofy. So it would be a bad thing if we could prove this. But suppose we were told to, um, how would we how would we go about trying to do it? Well, we would be forced to make some kind of error. So we assume there exists an x, f of x, and there exists an x, g of x. We separate these by and elimination. Now that's all fine, okay? But then what do we need to do? Well, what we would really want to do is say get f of a and g of a on a line together and then introduce the existential quantifier. So let's see if we can do that. Well, we can get f of a by hypothesis. Remember, the, this is going to be hard for some of you to remember, but the existential elimination move doesn't just allow you to break off the existential. It's a hypothesis, right? It's always a hypothesis. There isn't anything here like uh, that's, that's a analogy with universal elimination where you just break off the universal. Okay, so we have f of a, and that's actually just fine, okay, because a does not occur in the assumption. There go my dogs. But now, we said we want f of a and g of a. If we went to g of b, that would not be any good because we wouldn't be able to introduce the existential um, with x's on both of them. But so now we go to g of a, hypothesis for existential elimination. Now, since I just told you that you can't actually officially make a mistake right here because you can hypothesize in anything you want, then really this is not right here a mistake, but it's the beginning of a mistake. It's a mental mistake. So we put f of a and g of a together, and then we say, okay, great, let's go ahead and introduce the existential. So there exists an x, f of x, and g of x, and the question, and that's okay too, right? We can do that. We can introduce the existential on f of a and g of a. But now we say, well, now I got what I want, so let me get out of this existential elimination proof. And so I go ahead and write this very line again and take away the indent just like this and uh, drop a line, right? And I say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, can you see what's wrong with it? Well, what's wrong is that this is still a live hypothesis, and it contains A. And so the restriction on this, one of the restrictions on existential elimination, is that you can't do this move when A is still in a live hypothesis. So you see, the mistake really began right here with GA. That's where the mistake began. We should have said, oh no, we don't want to do that because we've already used A, okay? So A will definitely be live before we ever get rid of that. So we could have anticipated this, but um, for instructional purposes, we didn't. Okay, let's look at another example of an improperly done existential elimination proof. So there exists a y, x and there exists a y, f, x, y, therefore there exists an x, f, x, a. Now this is just kind of a version of uh, one we know we can't do, 
Okay, so let's say um, f means funnier. So there exists an x and there exists a y such that x is funnier than y, right? Something's funnier than something. Can we infer from that that something's funnier than Alvin? Of course not. We don't know anything about Alvin at all. We certainly don't know that Alvin isn't the funniest person in the world or in our little universe. So let's make, so let's see what would we'd have to do if we were forced to try to prove this invalid inference. Well, we're going to go ahead and hypothesize for existential elimination, there exists a Y, F, B, Y. Okay, so we can use any name we want here. And we're kind of thinking ahead because look, we don't want it to be A here. We want B to be something that can go in to the X spot. Okay, so there exists a Y, F, B, Y. And then we do another hypothesis for existential elimination and we now hypothesize FBA. So again, we are looking ahead here. This is going to make sense because what we want to do now is slap on an existential and go, there exists an X, FXA. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with the way that we've done the existential introduction. This is perfectly okay just to introduce for B. And it looks like we have gotten what uh, we needed to get. But our problem is similar to before. We're going to go ahead and rewrite there exists an XF, XA, because we want to punch out of this proof. But now look what's happened, right? We go ahead and cite 2. Now, fortunately, right, a, it's only A here and it's B here. So 2 is okay, even though this is live right? Even though 2 is still live, it doesn't, con it doesn't uh, contain A, so we haven't violated the restriction here, but A is still in the line that we are trying to determine it to uh, terminate the existential elimination proof with, and, and we're not allowed to do that either. So A has to disappear from the final line, and as a result, this very same line here, uh, in order to be in accord with the restrictions on existential elimination. All right, let's just go ahead and look at one other proof that we're forced to do badly because it's not actually a valid inference. I won't spend any time going through the intuitive reason why this isn't valid because it's kind of a peculiar, uh, it's kind of a peculiar assignment of values, but. So we've got for all X, there exists a Y, F, Y, or G, Y, X, and we're being asked to derive the proposition there exists a Y, F, Y, or G, Y, Y. So you can develop a strategy here fairly clearly. These are all the same variables, so clearly we're going to need all the same constant or name in each one of these if we're going to introduce an existential quantifier. So. Uh, we want to go ahead and, first of all, we've got a, a nice clean move with universal elimination to uh, any constant we like or name we like. So there exists a Y, F, Y, or G, Y, A will be fine. And now we need, of course, uh, A to occur in the, uh, in the Y spot as well. So you go ahead and I and this is an existential, of course, so it's going to have to be a hypothesis for existential elimination. Go ahead and go to A again. Now you might say to yourself, well, that's all right, because look, I uh, look at the assumption. There is no previous live hypothesis. I look at the assumption. A does not occur in it. So we're Jake. And then you just go happily along. We introduce there exists a Y uh, and the existential quantifier to get our conclusion. We discharge it in the very next line by 2, 3 through 4, and existential elimination. And you say, what's wrong with that? Well, can you see uh, what's wrong with it? So here what we've done is, you can probably felt it here, right, when we introduced A again. Now, that's not always wrong. 
uh, there can be times when you can introduce A even though it occurs somewhere else in the proof. We've uh, already seen that. But it can't occur, you were right to check, in an assumption. It can't occur in any previous hypothesis. But it also cannot occur in the existentially quantified formula that you're going to be citing down here. In other words, the one you are essentially instantiating. So A occurs right here, and that's what made that wrong. So all these mistakes are basically the same kind of mistake. Well, they all violate a different rule, but essentially what's happening is you're using a name that is in some sense uh, playing an essential role in the proof that isn't just there because it was universally instantiated to, for example, or universally eliminated to, um, but you're using specific information about it to derive your conclusion. So again, the formal mistake occurs in red here. That's where we have to say, ooh, that's really bad. But on line three is where we should be saying, look out, it looks like you're uh, going down the wrong road. Okay, so let's look uh, now at a couple of uh, tricky proofs, but um, they're, they're perfectly good proofs. So think about this, this uh, relationship here. Now you'll notice the double turnstiles here. That means we're dealing with an equivalence. You'll remember that. And this says for all x, f of x is logically equivalent to, it's not the case that there exists an x such that not fx. And if you think about that in English, you'll see that that's definitely right. The first one says something like, the first proposition says something like, everything is funny. And the second proposition says something like, uh, it is not the case that something is not funny. So everything is funny really does mean that. Everything is funny means there is nothing that's not funny. So we should be able to prove these in both directions. So let's give it a try. You should try this. You can do this. Uh, so don't just uh, watch this, really struggle with this so that you can uh, figure out what sort of problem you come up with. And maybe you won't even uh, experience one. Okay, so we, we assume for all x, f of x, and we're going to derive, it's not the case that there exists an x, not f of x. So how can we do that? Well, we could go ahead and just instantiate f of a if we wanted to. Uh, that wouldn't really get us very far on its own. It looks like we're going to have to involve ourselves in a negation introduction by hypothesizing there exists an x, not f of x. So we do go ahead and, and do a universal elimination on, uh, on for all x, f of x to give for f of a. And then we hypothesize for negation introduction, there exists an x, not f of x. All right, so if you got that far, that's great. So what's next? Well, we have there exists an x such that not f of x, and so it looks like we can go ahead and do a hypothesis for existential elimination, right? Not f of a. Now wait a minute, is, th is, that, is that an okay move? Can we do that? You gotta check, right? Because after all, f of a is right there sitting on line two, but line two isn't the problem, right? Because line two is not an assumption. Here's an assumption. There's no a in it. Here's a previous hypothesis, there's no A in it. So actually, we're perfectly fine here. This is actually an okay thing to do. And notice that we have first got, so we started with the negation introduction, but now we're in an existential elimination proof. So what are we looking for here? What are we trying to do? Well. What we're trying to do, interestingly, is get a contradiction that we can um, preserve and actually punch out of the existential elimination proof with. And that's where we need uh, 
to be careful because if we write uh, if we write fa and not fa it's perfectly okay to do that from lines two and four and introduction if we write that and we try to discharge the hypothesis at this point look what happens a is still in the line right we had gone to a here and a is still in the uh, formula that we're trying to uh, terminate the existential elimination proof with and that's not okay so we can't do it that way so what do we do instead well we've actually used this technique previously in some of the homework problems um, and it's a it's it's at this point you're, it's a uh, technique that you're really going to want to remember because it's going to be essential to doing some existential elimination proofs so the way you do it is not this way right we can't do it this way but we can do it this way so what we do is we say okay we've got a contradiction fa not fa use our old friend the contradiction rule and write some other contradiction so what we're doing here is we're saying i need a contradiction that doesn't have a in it because i really want to punch out right here and preserve this contradiction which is what i'm looking for because i'm in a negation introduction proof so i'm going to just write p and not p and the reason i'm going to write p and not p is just to get any name get just purge it of all the names any contradiction is okay right so we don't even need any names in it so i write p and not p but theoretically any contradiction that didn't have a in it would be perfectly fine because you can write anything you want remember after the contradiction rule um, and we punch out with p and not p and then we've got our contradiction which is what we wanted so now we can assert just using negation introduction the uh, negation of our original hypothesis and we have demonstrated this proof so that's kind of a sweet little proof uh, not easy to figure out initially this here is really the only real trick though now let's work it the other way let's go from it's not the case that there exists an x not f of x to for all x f of x so we hypothesize it's not the case that there exists an x not f of x and now you'll notice that we cannot do anything to this line we can't do any kind of an existential elimination here that's not okay because this is locked up so if we hypothesize something expecting to be able to use it in relation to this assumption we would be wrong to do so it's important to struggle with this now and see if you can figure out how to think through this proof now the normal thing to try here for sure is a negation introduction and that would be a perfectly good thing to do that would show that you really know what you're doing it just turns out that in this case it's not very productive you could proceed and do everything that i'm about to show you uh, in the context of a negation introduction proof but it just doesn't actually contribute anything to the ultimate goal so here's how you can start to think about this let's go back to the original question now just think about the assumption for a second it's basically telling us that everything is f right it says it's not the case that there exists something such that not fx it's not the case that there exists an x such that not fx in other words everything is f well that means that if you were say to just hypothesize that something's not f that should be contradictory that that definitely contradicts the assumption in terms of what the assumption means so what if you did that what if you hypothesize not fa in an attempt to get a contradiction could you do it well the answer is yeah you could because if you get not fa then you get through existential introduction there exists an x not fx which kind of coolly contradicts the assumption 
right? So we now actually do have a, uh, a contradiction, which we can write. And we don't need to get fancy about it because there is no name in here at all. So it's not the case that there exists an x not fx, and there exists an x not fx is a contradiction. In fact, we're not even in the context of an existential elimination proof here. So we have our contradiction, and as a result, we can just punch right out and say not not fa. Okay, now with not not fa, we can apply double negation and get f of a, and finally just add on for all x fx. Now you'll remember, of course, that universal introduction does have restrictions on it. It's not quite as uh, complicated in its restrictions as existential elimination, but remember what are those restrictions? They're two of the same ones that apply to existential elimination, namely A can't be in an assumption. There's only one assumption here. A is not in it, and it can't be in any undischarged hypothesis. Well, there is no undischarged hypothesis. We had one hypothesis but it has already been discharged, so this is a perfectly legitimate move. So let's go ahead and try to consolidate our understanding of existential elimination. I'm going to give you uh, two versions of, uh, of a summary. The first one is a, this informal summary, and, and when I call it informal, I don't mean that it's somehow not good enough. Uh, for our purposes, it's really good, uh, probably a better way of understanding it in the formal way uh, because it's easier to understand. But what I mean by informal is that I'm going to state the rule um, with respect to a particular uh, formula rather than a general characterization of any formula. So this just says if you have some exist existentially quantified formula, for example, there exists an x, f, x, a, you can hypothesize FCA, which you get by removing the existential and substituting a C in for the X. Um, and this and it can, doesn't have to be C. It can be any name except A. And you can do this for the purpose of an existential elimination proof, so long as we abide by these restrictions. So, so long as the name, which is C, does not occur in any assumption or any undischarged hypothesis. And those are just the two familiar ones from universal elimination. And so long as it doesn't occur in their existing x f of x a itself, which is actually something I already said up here, that is to say it can't be a or any other name in the formula. And the uh, it can't finally end up in the conclusion of the hypothetical derivation. So in other words, it can't occur in the line that we are uh, ending the existential elimination proof on. So that's what we've uh, sort of uh, been uh, explaining for these past several slides. And then we discharge the hypothesis in the, in the familiar way by removing the indent and dropping the line, but the unfamiliar uh, sort of thing is that we repeat the final line. We actually just reiterate the final line. So each of these uh, um, hypothetical rules have their own unique way of terminating. And I don't state here how we justify it, but you already know we cite three lines in the justification. Okay, now Here's the more general and formal statement of the rule of existential elimination. And this is really uh, just a very, very precise statement. But the more precise we get, uh, that is, doesn't uh, necessarily mean that the more uh, sort of uh, understanding we get. Unless you really spend a lot of time studying this, this might not elevate your understanding. But it's still important for us to provide it. This, is, again, is a little bit different than the way Book says it. Let's see if you can hang with this and see that we're really just giving a formal characterization of what we just said earlier. So for any existentially quantified formula, there exists a VP 
Okay, so there exists a V, V is some variable, and P is some proposition that will contain V somewhere in it, maybe multiple times. Any existential existentially quantified formula that exists a V, P, and a derivation of some conclusion R from a hypothesis H that is the result. The hypothesis is the result of removing there exists a V, right, removing it here right, and substituting every occurrence of V in P with some name A that is not in P. If you have all that, then we may discharge the hypothesis and assert R, but only if A does not occur in any assumption, any undischarged hypothesis, or R itself. Now that is exactly what we just said, but in a much more formal way. And you might be saying, well, why are there uh, only three restrictions here when previously there were four? Well, the answer is there's still four restrictions, but, but uh, in the previous case, I just decided to repeat myself. Here, in fact, is the fourth restriction right here, just telling you that A cannot occur in the originally, uh, in the existentially uh, quantified formula. Okay, all right, so let's look at one last proof. You know, what you really ought to do is just take a break and uh, then come back and see if you can uh, and launch yourself with this one and then do it on your own. So this is a sort of a standard difficulty uh, existential elimination proof. And I'll show you two different ways of doing it. Um, go ahead and give it a try. So for all x, f of x, then g of x, and there exists an x such that not g of x is supposed to imply that it's not the case that for all x, f x. Okay, so if you look at the first assumption, you can see a universally quantified statement, which we can easily take to any constant we like, f, a, b, just take your pick, and we have an existentially quantified statement, which we can apply existential elimination to. And perhaps we should be starting to think in terms of an of a negation elimination, right? Because this, uh, it's not the case that for all x, f of x is not something that we can construct by um, just slapping on a universal quantifier because the negation has to be on the outside of it. So one way to approach this would be to go ahead and do a hypothesis for existential elimination. So we go to not g of a, we choose a because a doesn't occur anywhere in any previous assumption. And then we uh, do a hypothesis for negation introduction. So we hypothesize for all x, f, x. And then we can actually start to make some hay, right? Because we have for all x, f, x, then g, x, and for all x, f, x. So if we, and those are both unrestricted moves, so we might as well go to a. So f, a, then g, a, by one in universal elimination, and uh, f of a by 4 in universal elimination gives us g a, which gives us our contradiction, right? Lines 3 and 7 gives us a contradiction. But we are, uh, you'll remember that we had in the past a, a little problem punching out of an existential elimination proof with f a and g a here. But notice here, we're not in the middle of an existential elimination proof, we're in the middle of a negation introduction proof. So actually, in this case, it's okay just to conjoin GA and not GA by three and introduction and get out of our negation introduction uh, proof by uh, negating the hypothesis. So we have it's not the case that for all x, f, x. Now the trick here is to remember you're not done, right? We do want it's not the case that for all x, f, x, and we do have it, but we still have an open hypothesis. 
So what do we have to do? We have to get rid of the, uh, the first hypothesis, which is an existential elimination. So the way we do that is just to restate the line, because this is, after all, what we want. So we restate. It's not the case that for all x f, for all x f x, we state the original existentially quantified hypothesis two, and cite lines three through nine, and that's it. Now the question arises: What if we had done these in a different order? What if we had hypothesized for all x f x first, and then uh, for negation introduction, and then hypothesize ex existential elimination. So maybe we could try that. Let's go ahead and hypothesize uh, for all x f x first, and then an existential elimination. And then we do the same moves that we did before. If f a, then g a, f a, g a, and now we have our contradiction. But now we say, uh-oh, I'm in the middle of an existential elimination leg of the proof, so I'm not going to be able to punch out of this with g a and not g a, so what am I going to do? Just, I'm going to do what we learned, use con p and not p, and then we'll just punch out with p and not p. So now we have by p and not p, by 2, 4 through 8, existential elimination. And the nice thing about this, it doesn't even tempt us to think that we're done yet, right? Because this is certainly not the conclusion we want. What we wanted was a contradiction from our initial hypothesis. We have it now, so now we can negate the initial hypothesis, drop a line, 3 through 9, negation introduction, and we are done. So we'll go ahead and uh, look at some study questions. Remember, I mean, I'm a broken record about all this, but it's true. Uh, you understand this when you can go back through the lecture and do all of these proofs uh, all by yourself without getting all these study questions right is a important basic test of your comprehension, but there's just no substitute for doing the proofs.